السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم ایس اینڈ ویلکم سی یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان این لیکچر نمبر ٹوینٹی سیون آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور وی ہیو کورڈ بائی ناؤ کوائر فیو اسٹیپس ٹو بی ویری پرسائز سیون اسٹیپس ود ان دی اسٹریٹجک برانڈ مینجمنٹ پروسیس اینڈ دا لاسٹ بینگ ود رولس آف ود برانڈ پورٹ فولیوز ود ان دی third phase of the process, which is about developing uh, the strategies. We started with uh, the understanding on uh, the concept of uh, positioning, which uh, took us into the understanding what brands are all about. And uh, the first concept that we learned toward that um, the understanding was um, about the brand extensions, uh, which took us into uh, roles of uh, with multiple brands, meaning a multi-brand policy. And that is what we learned in the last lecture. After looking into the roles a multi-brand policy plays toward the managing brands, we now to make transition to how those roles are offered to brands and what status the brands can have within the management process relating with one company and uh, what are the relationships which are developed between uh, products and brands. Uh, once we have uh, the understanding of all that, uh, we can decide for our company uh, the kind of brand names that we're going to have and the strategies that we should employ um, toward our branding policy. Meaning whether we're going to go for line extensions or we're going to go for brand extensions or we're going to have a portfolio of various brands. Now, before I proceed further, I would like to have clarity on your part regarding the one concept, and that is that you just cannot draw a hard and fast line between different concepts of the branding, meaning line extensions, brand extensions, and portfolios of brands. In other words, this is not to say that all these are mutually exclusive, the meaning one excludes the other. If you are working with line extensions, you cannot work with the brand extensions and vice versa. Or if you're working uh, for uh, any one of these, you cannot go for a portfolio of uh, different brands. It is not that. You generally end up with a the hybrid kind of uh, a situation in which uh, you may be working with a line extension. You may also be working on uh, the brand extension. And at the same time, you are managing a portfolio of different brands. Uh, how and why could we end up with uh, a hybrid kind of a situation? We're going to uh, talk about that uh, during the lecture. Why is it that uh, the different companies could have different names for different products? Why is it that uh, one company has uh, just one name for all its products? The meaning, the name of the company also is the brand name for all the products the company offers in so many different and diverse categories. Why is it that in certain situations, the companies may not like to highlight their name on the packaging of different brand names that they offer? These are some of the questions that we have to look into and understand their answer in relation to certain strategic moves on part of the companies. Understanding toward all this could becomes easy if we keep one thing in our minds and that is there is a certain relationship between a product and a brand. A brand distinguishes one product from the other in the market and that is how it facilitates the process on part of the customer to buy one brand or to differentiate one brand from the other. It is branding which again um, indicates the source of the product's origin. So unless we have a very clear understanding of the product brand relationship, we are going to be at a loss to start understanding the different strategies which companies employ in order to work with different kinds of the branding policies and branding strategies. There are um, so many different situations in which companies behave in different ways. Generally what has been seen, companies involve themselves into six, broadly speaking, different kinds of 
strategic you know, frameworks or strategic moves in order to decide what kinds of brands they should be having for different situations or in order to satisfy different needs uh, in different segments and hence in different categories. So in other words, there is a system or there's a method that uh, describes the relationship between uh, a product and a brand. Uh, the system assigns the one brand uh, the one particular role and one particular status and uh, that is the system which basically lays foundation for a branding policy for a company. And that is the system that we're going to look into uh, with the help of um, the findings that we already have um, on part of different uh, the companies uh, that uh, have been employing uh, the, these different systems uh, which get translated into different strategies. So like I said earlier, there are six different areas uh, which uh, could be classified in terms of uh, understanding uh, this system of uh, uh, brand product relationship or in other words branding policy. Uh, the first strategy which is uh, generally employed by different um, companies, one strategy which uh, the companies employ toward their uh, the branding policy uh, or toward uh, the uh, relationship between the product and the brand is uh, what you may call the product brand strategy. Uh, under this strategy, uh, you assign uh, one uh, name to one particular product and which means uh, this particular product uh, occupies uh, one particular positioning. And this positioning is meant for the brand uh, which you have created and uh, to, to which you have assigned this particular role. So to summarize you know, what I've said, uh, you can say that it is the one product, one position, and one brand. So in other words, if you are wanting to introduce another product with differentiated features, they may be you know, within the same uh, category, um, in turn meaning uh, for another segment within the category, you go for another brand name. You do not under this strategy go for an extension, rather you go for another separate independent brand name. Now this is a strategy which is generally followed by the very resourceful and huge companies because it goes without saying when you start having different brand names for different segments, uh, meaning uh, when you are out to satisfy different needs with the help of uh, different brand identities and different entities, the exercise becomes too costly. And it only is the resourceful companies that can afford that kind of an exercise. Uh, because uh, you are dealing with a different position, it's a different brand name, and that position corresponds to uh, a different uh, product, and vice versa. To give you examples uh, from two different fields, uh, which uh, are very illustrative of uh, uh, the brand management of the strategies, uh, detergents and soaps. You have uh, the three different detergents, hypothetical situation. Uh, the one is positioned uh, for overall neatness. The other is the position for uh, stain removal, for example. Uh, yet another is uh, the meant for uh, best value for money. Same could be the case with soaps, that you have uh, the soaps, uh, products of soaps uh, for three different segments. Uh, the one is that talks about uh, the medicated nature of uh, the product. The other one is uh, which is positioned for uh, the energy. And yet there is another one that talks about uh, skin enhancement properties. And uh, hence the beauty and the emotional value with which you are trying to create with the help of that product. So what you're doing is that you are positioning all these products uh, of detergents and soaps um, for you know, six different segments, uh, three within uh, the detergents category and three within the soaps category uh, for different kinds of customers because they're having different expectations with different brand names. And uh, these uh, the brand uh, names uh, have look at their own territories and uh, they enjoy independent communication campaigns 
it because uh, the one is uh, not related to other at all uh, it just happens that uh, all those brands are owned by the same company but uh, in terms of their uh, the marketing properties or uh, the marketing relationships so to say uh, they do not derive any uh, from each other that also becomes kind of a disadvantage which i will talk about later but uh, let us uh, be done first with uh, the kind of advantages which uh, this uh, the product brand strategy offers uh, to companies i would like to uh, show you uh, before i start talking about the advantages in detail the uh, graphical illustration of uh, the concept of um, the brand uh, product or product brand strategy that as you can see from the screen um, three different products could have three different positionings and uh, hence these three products could happen to be three different brands uh, the illustration is uh, the self explanatory and you know, in the sense that uh, you do not see any interface between uh, three different uh, segments you do not see any uh, commonalities uh, so to say uh, as far as um, the segmental uh, the boundaries uh, are concerned they do not have contiguous borders they are far apart and uh, it is just like saying that uh, these uh, three different uh, the products or brands so to say could have been introduced by three different companies now why is it that uh, these three uh, the brands are uh, offered by the same company and the company is uh, the taking a lot of pains and is investing uh, an awful amount of money in order to establish these brands knowing that the exercise is risky it is costlier and uh, it is going to take more energy uh, and time and everything um, still companies could opt for that well like i pointed out earlier this is uh, the strategic game which is played by strong companies it is not something which is uh, undertaken by uh, companies that are uh, not very strong in terms of their uh, resources because all resources financial resources the human resources and the marketing resources the reason these companies uh, like to get into uh, different segments with the help of uh, different brands because they like to follow the principle of uh, the multiplication of players within the overall category to energize the market to create um, an aggregate effect which can be created only by having so many different players uh, and uh, then having those players talk about uh, different uh, points of difference um, and uh, telling the total market about their respective products and customers in the process with the gaining total exposure to the market in its entirety so these companies being very resourceful and powerful uh, think to themselves the why shouldn't we be the one to get into different segments by not highlighting our name and introducing different brands and thus creating the effect of multiplication of players and thus at the end of the process dominating various segments of the category so this is how these companies get if successful with which they are in many instances dominate the most of the segments of the category with the result that uh, there are uh, the many a situation in which um, strong companies end up dominating the whole category and uh, they occupy uh, so many different uh, the meaningful uh, segments of the category without uh, the naming uh, the such companies uh, the you uh, i would uh, the leave it to your imagination uh, the kind of companies uh, that are involved in uh, uh, this kind of uh, practice they are uh, basically within the uh, consumer uh, consumables and um, well there are companies that also are uh, in consumer durables uh, and the reason is just about the same the rationale is common to the whatever these different manufacturers uh, the do to their brands uh, these companies think that, uh, that they can really get the preempt different segments uh, the by keeping competition off limit and uh, 
they may not succeed with 100% by keeping uh, their competition off limits. Um, but um, the competition which uh, eventually makes the inroads into their territories may not be that successful as uh, these companies may be because of the resources and because of the experience they have gained over the years and decades in this kind of uh, strategic uh, moves. Okay. okay, having said uh, all that about uh, the strength of the companies and uh, the resourcefulness with which uh, really actuate um, uh, companies into framing you know, these kind of strategic moves, uh, we now talk about a few more uh, advantages with which uh, this strategy uh, offers to customers. Well, customers are in a better position to differentiate between different uh, brands. I mean, it becomes uh, less difficult for, or rather easy you know, for the customers to see the one brand from the other. Conversely, if you have for the brand extensions, the graphics or the external manifestations uh, of uh, those extensions uh, do have a lot of similarities. And uh, it is just like uh, you know, the offspring uh, from one family uh, having so many similarities in terms of their features. Uh, uh, the brands can be identified immediately that this is the one you know, which has been extended out of this parent and therefore should be very much like the one you know, which we already are using. So in order to overcome that kind of uh, a limitation on you know, the part of the, uh, the line extensions, the manufacturers you know, who are resourceful uh, like to get into different brands. So different brands you know, make it easy uh, for uh, customers to differentiate uh, the one from the other. Different brands could also could help customers uh, to differentiate uh, the points of difference uh, in a better way. And the fact of the matter is that it is because of um, this ability of um, the portfolio of uh, the different brands that um, it enables customers to start appreciating the concept of positioning uh, much better uh, than it could be otherwise. Meaning, it is only because of a better appreciation of this concept that you start realizing uh, a very strong and distinct position of a detergent uh, having the properties of removing certain kinds of stains. It is because of this that uh, you start appreciating uh, certain properties uh, of a soap in terms of it carrying uh, the medicated uh, properties or it carrying um, an element of uh, the beauty enhancement and therefore uh, the giving you uh, the some um, uh, the emotional uh, the linkage uh, with uh, the brand. So it is uh, the one of the uh, advantages of uh, the having uh, the portfolio of uh, the brands um, and uh, the within that portfolio, the reason I'm talking about that is within that portfolio, having different brands by the same company. Don't forget that we are talking about the one position, the one product and one brand. And uh, when you put all together, uh, because they all belong to one company, so that becomes you know, a big portfolio. And within that portfolio, whether you have, you know, those three different brands or six different brands, you can also say that you have, you know, six different portfolios within the parent portfolio of that particular company. And uh, that is what you may also call portfolio management, portfolio marketing management, because uh, you being the brand manager uh, are responsible for uh, just one brand and somebody else for another brand. So different managers are handling different portfolios. And uh, that is uh, a subject of uh, the portfolio management, but which uh, is not uh, uh, within the scope of uh, this discussion at the moment. But uh, to facilitate your understanding, we are talking about uh, one brand, one product, one position. And uh, the, in the process, I started giving you examples and uh, related examples with portfolio and all that. Because we are trying to learn, why is it that the companies could have the one strategy which deals with the portfolios and then you know, the same company starts dealing with another strategy which is not a product brand relationship but you see it is something else.
because uh, the name of the, uh, the company is not really highlighted on uh, the different brands, and uh, the brands are very independent entities and identities, it helps uh, these companies in case of a failure. If a brand um, fails, it um, does not affect other brands within the portfolio, meaning within the overall portfolio. So companies uh, think they are kind of um, secure uh, in terms of a failure uh, on part of the one brand. They introduced a brand, it was not a success, they will make another effort and do something else uh, with, with that product with the help of some other brand name, so on and so forth. Having talked about the uh, properties or the advantages uh, that this uh, uh, product brand strategy uh, carries, uh, this also has uh, certain drawbacks uh, because uh, there is nothing you know, which is uh, without disadvantages or drawbacks. The uh, drawbacks basically are uh, the economic. Uh, what are the strengths automatically become uh, uh, drawbacks also uh, because uh, what is the uh, upside of a situation uh, that also uh, gets translated into a downside. So if uh, we say that uh, the one different brands uh, have different identities and if one fails, it doesn't really um, affect the uh, performance of the other brands, we can now say that uh, every launch of a new brand is a new launch. It is not a question of uh, extending your product and thereby economizing on so many different costs um, within the operations and uh, the more so on the advertising and promotions front. So each launch is a new launch and uh, it entails a lot of expenditure. You will recall from uh, one of the previous lectures uh, on brand extensions that uh, the cost of introducing a brand extension is one-fifth of introducing a standalone brand. And in the developed markets of the world, meaning the United States, Japan, and the European market, um, the cost of uh, the making one brand, meaning a standalone brand, a successful, um, is one billion dollars. So uh, you can well imagine the costs involved. Uh, however, I would hasten to add here that um, uh, this may not be the same level of cost which we incur in our market, but one fact is for sure that the cost of launching a separate independent brand is very high in relation to launching an extension. Other drawback could be retailers resisting stocking of a new brand. They are skeptical because they are not very sure of the success of the new brand. Uh, and thereby not offering um, a lot of shelf space, uh, meaning overall their uh, receptiveness to the, the, the brand is uh, not very high. And this, in a way, brings in the factor of uh, resourceful companies, or uh, the companies being powerful and resourceful. That is why this uh, the strategy is undertaken by companies that are very powerful because uh, because of that power, they enjoy the marketplace. They are in a better position to negotiate with retailers and distributors, the stocking and uh, the movement which uh, they require be given patronage by members of the trade uh, better than those companies which are not very powerful. Multiplication of product brands, only because uh, we want to uh, be in um, segments which are narrowly defined, uh, but nevertheless have uh, the different brands, is something which requires a quick return on investment. And I think it is obvious uh, that uh, the quick return on investment is required because you end up investing an awful lot of money into introducing and launching that independent brand. And that is possible only if you happen to launch your products in those markets which are new, which are emerging, meaning the markets from which you can generate small volumes with high margins. 
if you wait for uh, the huge uh, the volumes, uh, you have to uh, wait for that. And uh, it is not all that easy because uh, uh, bigger markets are uh, mostly you know, saturated markets. And uh, if not saturated, they are intensely competitive markets. And therefore, when you um, follow this kind of a strategy, you like to enter uh, the markets which are new and which are emerging because the chances of recovering your investment from those kind of markets um, are higher than getting into those markets which are very competitive and you start fighting head on with your uh, the major competitors. Well, if you could happen to could enjoy the total category and uh, you've got uh, the 100% um, share of the market, which generally is not the case, um, that's something else, but uh, the competition is there. When I say the dominating the category or dominating you know, the various segments of the category, that uh, should not mean 100% of the market. All right, uh, another uh, the disadvantage which uh, this strategy um, carries with it is the impenetrable divisions. You know, all those brands have defined independent territories to themselves, and which means that the one just cannot enter the other. I said that earlier. There is no interaction, there is no interface, and therefore the success of one brand does not ensure success of another brand because of no connection whatsoever. And uh, the last, I would say, disadvantage relating this strategy is that distributors do not really offer the patronage uh, the to uh, new products because of uh, the skepticism they have. I talked about retailers uh, and, and uh, it automatically meant the members of the trade the meaning to the distributors and wholesalers, because if you're working in markets where you have a, a very extensive chain, uh, the buyer resistant stocking, because they're not really sure of the success. So by the same tokens, they are uh, not only uh, resisting stocking, they also are not in a mood generally to offer their patronage, which in most of the cases they do, the ones they uh, assess that uh, the brand has a lot of potential and uh, can really move uh, pretty fast in the market. But then again, uh, this is something which is uh, related with uh, the, the power of, the, of a company um, it enjoys in the marketplace. So it becomes relative. Uh, it is uh, not a hard and fast thing, uh, but this is relative. Uh, generally speaking, you should not really overlook this factor. Well, that's all about uh, the first the strategy, which is the uh, product brand strategy and which uh, resourceful companies employ uh, toward their the branding policies. Let us now talk about uh, the second strategy, which deals with uh, uh, line extensions. And uh, you may call it line brand strategy. Dealing with extensions, this uh, makes the whole concept very um, understandable because uh, I've talked so much about extensions and I'm sure that your understanding about extensions is uh, very clear. It generally deals with uh, getting into those products which are uh, basically complementary and which have a fit across the emotional values of the same uh, kind of uh, clientele or the customer base. Uh, to give you an example of uh, line brand strategy, Suppose a manufacturer has launched a brand of lipstick. Once the, the brand is successful, uh, it doesn't take a genius to guess that um, that manufacturer should get into other products which have an element of uh, complementarity and fit. Uh, the two elements that we talked about earlier. Uh, and uh, he should get into things like uh, maybe the mascara or um, you know, cleansing cream. Uh, these are the products which are going to be uh, used by the same uh, the customers and uh, they run across you know, those uh, emotional uh, values that uh, the customers have and the associations that uh, they have developed with that particular brand of lipstick. Um, 
in in summary, I can say that uh, the effort under this strategy is to create products which are coherent and uh, which are very logical in terms of their relationship with uh, the first product which the manufacturer launched and uh, because of which you know, he's getting into extensions. To make this uh, understanding uh, a little uh, clear, I would like you to take a look at the screen which um, shows the, uh, the graphical look at the presentation of uh, this line brand strategy. You can take a look at uh, the cosmetics uh, the market, I mean the cosmetics line which uh, the manufacturer is trying to develop. The manufacturer started with uh, the lipstick which is the first product and uh, then the line is being stretched. He has uh, the three products which he is selling in the market and uh, there's every chance that uh, he will make better use of this strategy and get into the couple of more products. Uh, until the time he must start realizing that uh, the stretch is not um, infinite. Uh, it will break you know, somewhere along the line. That is one thing you know, that we uh, must keep in mind all the time. Uh, so, in other words, this kind of a strategy exploits the success of uh, the concept, basically. It exploits the success of the concept uh, which uh, the manufacturer introduced with the first product and uh, then uh, extending the brand uh, while staying very close uh, to the central concept. So this is uh, what the strategy is all about. And I think we also know that uh, every company and uh, every manufacturer starts with one product, which is one brand. And it is that standalone brand or that one product which subdivides itself into the subspecies. And uh, it is the success of that which may lead you into thinking about so many different categories and so on and so forth, um, eventually giving you the complexion um, and uh, the, the, the character of uh, um, a marketing company that uh, really has a combination of so many different strategies at work in order to address different kinds of needs. So much uh, for the time being, I will uh, wrap this up uh, once I have talked about all the strategies with which companies have to themselves. Um, there are certain benefits as far as uh, this uh, strategy is concerned. And uh, the first benefit is economic. The uh, cost of extension is uh, very marginal. I mean, uh, the only costs that uh, the companies can have to bear relate to the distribution, um, which again are uh, in a way direct costs which you cannot escape, and uh, the costs in terms of uh, the packaging, um, which again is uh, the not an indirect or fixed cost. So the costs are, I would say, just marginal. It reinforces the selling power of the company uh, by extending the, the base of uh, the customers uh, who are uh, the same customers or you know, it may also attract more customers because you have uh, more than one product to offer um, and hence uh, all the associations and emotional values and uh, the, the kind of emotional framework that uh, they talked about earlier in relation to a brand value pyramid. It leads to ease of distribution. Distribution is not that uh, difficult. Uh, conversely, when you are dealing with uh, you know, so many different brands uh, within a portfolio, uh, you are uh, dealing with different um, distributors. And that is on purpose because you don't really want to have uh, the conflict. I'll talk about that also in relation to one of the uh, strategies. It reduces launch costs. So these are the few the benefits, which of course are very economic, and uh, these are the ones which uh, actuate uh, you to get into uh, line brand strategy. The only drawback is that uh, you have to stay very close to the existing uh, the product. Uh, it uh, does not offer you the um, power uh, immediately and instantaneously uh, to uh, distance yourself from the uh, central concept uh, by a great margin. The third strategy which uh, the companies uh, the generally use is the range brand strategy. A uh, range brand strategy is all about just one brand, having one promise, but at the same time having a range of products. I don't want to make it confusing and that is why I'm trying to explain every concept with the help of uh, 
uh, graphics. Uh, but in order to make it clear, before I show you the graphics, think of um, a brand of forget the suitcases, and it answers uh, everything. You have you know a bigger size of suitcase, a smaller size of suitcase, and a small size of suitcase. And you also have you know, briefcases of different kinds. You don't really have uh, uh, different brand names for all those. You do not even call them extensions because uh, they are not these subspecies in terms of having different names. If the parent brand is brand A, but you do not call them A1, A2, A3, no. Everything is known by the same name. Look at um, the market of um, soups or the market of um, sauces. Uh, range brands uh, mostly are popular among uh, the food items and uh, luggage manufacturers. There is one range, of course, having different positions, but the promise is the same. If a luggage manufacturer promises durability and ease of uh, handling, then that's the promise it carries all through the range. So that is the beauty of this concept. It's easy, it's pretty straightforward. Communication takes place in uh, the just one name and uh, it promotes the whole range. Uh, brand, in other words, communicates in a generic manner uh, by developing a unique concept. The concept is pretty straightforward, but it also happens to be unique because it uh, covers the whole range. Uh, let us take a look at uh, the graphics of uh, the concept. Uh, you have the brand at top, and uh, that brand uh, addresses the one, uh, the concept which is uh, common to uh, the whole range, and uh, within the range you have uh, different products. You have product A, product B, C, and D, and uh, that's the, the product formation. Nothing uh, complicated about um, the, uh, the concept itself. All right, let us now move on to another strategy, which is uh, the very important strategy and uh, is employed by um, so many different huge manufacturers. Uh, making so many different products. And uh, this is what you may call the umbrella brand strategy. Now this is a strategy about which uh, so many students have a lot of questions. Uh, it is when the same brand supports several products in different markets, uh, you call that an umbrella brand. If you really uh, scratch your brains and uh, start looking at uh, big manufacturers uh, on the international level, that you will think to yourself that, uh, that there's a manuf there is a manufacturer who is into motorbikes and uh, it also is into uh, the musical instruments like pianos and guitars and it also uh, makes um, generators. It may also be in a uh, few other categories, but uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, then you see there is uh, a manufacturer which is into manufacturing of uh, electrical bulbs and electrical systems of different kinds and um, then you know television sets and um, other appliances you know which you use in the kitchens so this the manufacturer is uh, dealing in so many different categories meaning in so many different markets under the same name and that name is the umbrella and you have a company that makes you know ships the company also makes cars, and the company also happens to be into the foods uh, area, and um, the company also is into banking. Every product that uh, the company makes is made under the same brand name. So the company may be having diverse products, They're meant for different markets, not having any relationships among themselves, but yet the product carries the same name. Now, what are the advantages uh, by having uh, this kind of strategy? Uh, before I start talking about that, let us take a look at the graphics which uh, uh, illustrates the concept uh, in absolute clarity. As you can see uh, from the screen, uh, we have um, the umbrella brand uh, right on top. And uh, this umbrella brand is uh, getting into uh, so many different areas. And uh, I'm showing here four different markets. So the brand is getting into four different markets with four different products. One could be, you know, chips, one could be motorbikes, one could be cars, the other could be guitars or whatever. The important thing here is that uh, 
It is the same brand name, but in every case, it's a different product and it's a different concept. I mean, if you are into car making, that's one concept. And if you're into foods, that's another. There's a gulf between the two concepts. So one product, one concept, and one market. If you take a look at uh, the first one on the left-hand side, which I call market A, uh, it becomes very obvious that uh, the market is um, having one brand by this company. And therefore, the total communication effort relating this brand is going to revolve around this particular market. And this market does not really have any relationship with uh, the next market, which is, which is market B, with having concept B and product B. This market also is going to have its own set of communications. We are dealing with different markets, we are dealing with different products, but the brand name happens to be the same. Now the question is, uh, why is it that uh, the companies get into this practice? Well, there are uh, certain benefits. And uh, one of the benefits is that uh, the companies like to capitalize on the strength they already have created with the help of brands that are successful. It may be just one brand or it may be a combination of brands, meaning it may be a large portfolio, you know. So strength you know, in one market or in a combination of markets makes it uh, very tempting for these companies to use the same brand name for another market which they are targeting. And uh, very closely related uh, with this benefit is uh, another benefit which you may call instantaneous goodwill. Companies can gain the instantaneous goodwill if uh, they launch a good product. Again, we have to keep in mind that uh, it's only the huge companies which get into this kind of practice. And to go further on this concept, I would say that uh, it mostly is the Japanese companies that uh, really specialize in uh, the umbrella branding. Not to say others are not into umbrella branding. There are companies, but Japanese really have uh, a lot of expertise in this area. When they enter a new market, they enter with a lot of know-how, technical expertise, a lot of resources, on all fronts and see to it that product succeeds. And when the product succeeds, it adds to the goodwill. Not only it creates you know, instantaneous goodwill because of the past history, that new product which is a success also creates goodwill and that adds to the image capital. So in other words, when an umbrella is attractive because you want to capitalize on that umbrella, uh, because it has uh, so many uh, different uh, strong products. It's the same brand, mind it. It has so many different strong products, it attracts you toward itself. And when you introduce something new, that also becomes a success. It adds to the strength of the umbrella. So that is, this is a two-way uh, process. And... Um, this is very much uh, the same concept that uh, we discussed in relation to um, brand extensions, that um, you like to go for uh, extensions because uh, of the image capital. A brand has image capital. You are attracted to have access to that capital. But once you have the access and you make the new entry also successful, you add to that capital. So this is a common feature between the brand extension and that extension which takes place under the same name. This also is something which is taking place under the same name, although it is operating in so many different markets. I mean, that's where the catch is, and don't forget that. Another benefit, which is a huge benefit, is awareness. Companies could have to invest a lot of money in order to create awareness. Because without awareness, there's just no way that your products are going to be tried in the marketplace. And it is that stage of the communication process, which I shall be, dis which I shall be discussing later, that um, involves a, a major chunk of uh, uh, the, the communication uh, investment. When you have for the umbrella brand, you do not really have to invest that much into creating awareness and therefore 
you achieve scale economies on that front with the help of the strength of the brand, which is all pervasive and all encompassing. People know that brand and it is a part of their lives in one way or the other. Wrap up the, the benefits that uh, this strategy of umbrella branding offers to the companies. Uh, I would say it once again that uh, the only companies with uh, the huge reputation uh, in the marketplace are in a position to uh, go for umbrella branding. I mean, just think of uh, the manufacturer uh, who is new to the market and uh, whose uh, capital um, in terms of image and awareness and reputation is not all that great. Uh, the umbrella branding is not going to be very helpful because the people do not even know about that. So it is only the once you have developed a certain level of reputation in the market that you start getting into umbrella branding. And the companies that specialize in umbrella branding, they also started with uh, uh, the one product at one time. Meaning there was a time uh, in the history when these companies were just one product and one brand companies. So it is the, the overall capital in relation to all the factors that I've uh, discussed uh, that the companies could have got more and more motivated in terms of uh, the getting into uh, different markets with the help of the same brand name, which was very strong and which still is very strong. One of the largest constraints that uh, the strategy of uh, the umbrella branding has is um, that uh, under this concept, you have to compete against specialists. The meaning if you are uh, into cars, that you are competing with a company that is just making cars. If you happen to be into electronics, which is one of your divisions under the same brand name, you are competing against that company that is only into electronics. So the ability to compete with specialists calls for a very high level of uh, uh, technical expertise and uh, the diversity of knowledge, which is as good as that of uh, the specialists. And if you are a company that can uh, overcome uh, this constraint, uh, then nothing is stopping you from becoming successful um, in the marketplace. And that is why I said it is only the huge companies with a lot of resources that can um, uh, give the character of an independent company or independent corporation to their divisions. I mean, even the divisions are so huge that uh, they are bigger than so many independent companies. So if you are in a position to uh, give to your company and to your brands that kind of a character, you are successful in um, introducing and sustaining the umbrella brands. There's another constraint which uh, is an extension of the one that uh, I've just talked about. Um, and that is about uh, the product relevance. You have to produce such a good quality that uh, your product is uh, considered relevant by the customers. Because customers um, also know that uh, there are specialists in the marketplace. And uh, why should we go for a brand made by the company which is into so many different markets and hence they may not have uh, the level of expertise uh, which a specialist has. So you've got to prove to the marketplace that uh, you're very relevant and um, uh, that re relevance uh, must resonate all over the place. Only then customers are going to take you seriously and um, that again proves the one fact that uh, the only companies with uh, a huge reputation and uh, a great pool of resources uh, can be successful in this kind of a strategy and uh, not others. Uh, while you are uh, getting into different markets, there again is a limit to it. And uh, that is the limit which uh, some experts call the rubber effect. The rubber effect is that uh, it, is, uh, it has a lot of elasticity. And if you extend that, there's a point where it snaps. And before you see it breaks, because you've got to make sure uh, what are your limits. And uh, despite all the resources at your disposal, uh, despite to see the, the huge brand capital that you have at your disposal uh, because of your being so successful in so many different markets, shouldn't mean that you automatically get into any market that you may think of. 
or you may wish to get into because the rubber is going to break. The rubber effect is something that, uh, that these companies are going to have to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, now, this is what uh, you know, the marketing experts and uh, the business experts um, say. You know, so the, there's, there's a lot of um, relevance to this concept. But that's one of the constraints uh, these companies uh, with my, or, or umbrella brands that might run into, and they've got to be very mindful of uh, such uh, constraints. Having said that, I would like to wrap my today's lecture up and to uh, talk about the remaining strategies uh, at uh, the disposal of different companies uh, in the next lecture. But uh, what we have to keep in mind is uh, the different situations are going to offer um, themselves uh, with different variables and different dynamics. So uh, it is uh, upon the companies to uh, look into those situations in a very uh, strategic manner and then see uh, which strategy really is the one that suits its circumstances. Uh, more on that in the next lecture. Allah Hafiz. Until that time.